Going Psycho with a look back at Hitchcock's horror masterpiece. Behind the scenes on the TV series Poltergeist The Legacy. Plus, the new sci-fi series Welcome to Paradox, Nebula award-winning author Gregory Benford's commentary, and our sci-fi best bets. Welcome to Sci-Fi Entertainment, the only TV magazine dedicated to science fiction, horror, and fantasy. I'm Chase Masterson. And I'm Scott Nance. Later in the show, we'll meet the editor of Fangoria, a fan who actually works in his favorite genre. But first, here's Chase with the buzz from the Sci-Fi Wire. You think these are the rules of the game? I'll go outside it. I'll show you things that you haven't seen. Paul Verhoeven, director of Starship Troopers, Total Recall, and RoboCop, has just signed to do his next film. The Hollow Man, a drama about a man who becomes invisible, is scripted by Andrew Marlowe, who also wrote last summer's Air Force One. Shooting is scheduled to start by year's end, and with Verhoeven on board, it's shaping up as a so-called event film for Columbia Pictures. Four years ago, Section Chief Blevins assigned me to a project you all know as the X-Files. This year's Emmy Award contenders have been announced, and The X-Files is tied with ER as the most nominated primetime drama. The X-Files earned an impressive 16 Emmy nominations, including Outstanding Lead Actor for David Duchovny, Outstanding Lead Actress for Gillian Anderson, and Outstanding Writing for the show's creator, Chris Carter. Both Anderson and Duchovny have each been nominated three times before, but only Gillian has taken home a trophy. The Emmy Awards ceremony airs live on NBC on Sunday, September 13th. Ghostbusters 3 is now much more than an apparition, as Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis have begun working on the screenplay. The director of the original film, Ivan Reitman, has met with the ghost-busting duo and may executive produce the third installment. For daily sci-fi news updates, check out the online Sci-Fi Wire. Just point your browser to www.scifi.com. You know, Chase, Alfred Hitchcock would have been 99 this week. He was born on August 13, 1899. And I bet if he was living, he'd still be making movies. Oh, no doubt. But his work lives on as he continues to scare generation after generation. For example, Hitchcock's Psycho was recently chosen by the American Film Institute as one of the top 20 films of all time. Psycho has its roots in the 1950s with a real-life murder in the hamlet of Plainfield, Wisconsin. The late author, Robert Block, was living in a nearby town and read about the crime in the newspaper. At the time that I lived in Wisconsin, there was a murder committed by Mr. Ed Gein, generally called Ed Gein by the people that didn't know him, apparently. And uh, all that interested me about this gentleman was the fact that he had lived in a town even smaller than the one I was living in and was able to get away with murder without anybody finding out about it. And I said, there's got to be a story here. Block never learned much about the real-life killer or his motivations. Very little was being said about it, because in those days the press was quite prudish about giving details. So I had to more or less invent this character. So I invented Norman Bates. In addition to the psychopath with the mother fixation, Block invented the Bates Motel and the shower in room number one. But screenwriter Joseph Stefano proposed a crucial change in the beginning of Block's story when he first met with Alfred Hitchcock. The legendary director had bought the screen rights to the novel and was looking for a writer to adapt it. I think the thing that got me the job was that when I went in and talked to him, um, I said that um, I would like to tell him the story of the, of the movie. And I said it, it starts out in a hotel room with a beautiful young woman and a man. They've had been shacking up on her lunch hour. And I proceeded to tell what you ultimately saw. And uh, <clears throat> as opposed to the book, which started with Norman Bates and his mother. Hotels of this sort aren't interested in you when you come in, but when your time is up. 
Hitchcock loved the idea of using Janet Lee's character as a decoy to lure the audience into thinking the whole picture was about her. That makes her murder 40 minutes into the film devastating. Part of the shock of Psycho, I think, was that you liked the character. You liked the way Janet Lee played her. You liked the fact that she was going to go back and face the music and give back the money. And, uh, and then she got killed, and that's exactly where I wanted to hit you. The film hit us all right. It became the most successful of Hitchcock's stellar career. But before its release, no one foresaw the phenomenon it would become. To Stefano, it was a B picture that was hardly in the same league as the Technicolor Vista Vision films Hitchcock was doing at the time. The movie was, uh, it was going to cost under a million dollars. Uh, it was going to be in black and white. It was nothing like North by Northwest or any of the movies that he had made. And uh, I felt uh, a little disappointed, actually. I would much rather have done a North by Northwest, you know? Though Psycho was shot quickly with a television crew, Hitchcock poured his creativity into the shower scene, taking a whole week to shoot the 45-second sequence. And of course, that scene is the most memorable in the film and one of the most memorable in film history. But it was the combination of three gifted artists, Robert Block, Joseph Stefano, and Alfred Hitchcock, which made Psycho the ultimate cinema shocker. Next up, the new Sci-Fi Channel series, Welcome to Paradox, plus Fangoria editor, Tony Timpone. Psycho cost only $800,000 in 1960 to make, yet the film has earned more than $40 million to date. More Psycho trivia in a moment. Alfred Hitchcock bought the rights to the novel, Psycho, anonymously from author Robert Block for just $9,000. Hitchcock then bought up as many copies of the book as he could to keep the ending a secret. In the future, nothing is impossible, and perhaps we should fear the possibilities. So say the producers of the Sci-Fi Channel's new one-hour anthology series, Welcome to Paradox. Oh, this is going to be good. I got the scramble up. So, will she split apart and make pretty sparkles, or will she just... Gina. Gina, call the cops now! Each week, the Sci-Fi Channel's new anthology series, Welcome to Paradox, presents cautionary tales of the future. The show's stories are based in science fiction, but as executive producer Lewis Chesler points out, many of them are on the way to becoming science fact. This particular universe, or this place, Betaville, is really a city of the near future. The stories lines are allegories, and the allegories are about the hunger for progress and the terror of knowledge. Because in some instances, in, mo in many of these instances, the, the, the desire for human improvement can often run up against traditional human tabu taboos. And those are the questions and the themes that we explore in the series. You think this is gonna work? Maybe. That's not what's worrying me. If we cross back into our real bodies, our physical bodies, we're gonna be weak. Actor A. Martinez stars in the upcoming Welcome to Paradox episode, News from D Street. He believes that most people don't realize the impact technology is playing in their lives. Technology tends to um, bully us into um, living uh, lives that we might not choose. Everybody just wants to like be able to keep up with everybody else, so as long as people keep inventing these more and more and more amazing kind of diversions, and capabilities, we just fall into place behind it without uh, seeming to be able to defend ourselves. Welcome to Paradox stories are selected from classic and current science fiction literature. This kind of show is, uh, the ideas are more compelling. You, you get into territory that isn't mined very often in uh, typical television programming, and it, it makes it a lot more fun to play. Um, there's surprises on a level that uh, you're not going to find too often. 
Welcome to Paradox isn't just about man's battle with science and technology. It also examines the complex and often extraordinary qualities that make up the human spirit. The stories are more intended to be emotional. Some of them are even love stories. And that is because what we're saying is that we are ultimately redeemed by love. You know, that, that it is a greater force, perhaps, than even our technological potential. What is she? She's called a Waldo. We grew her. In the upcoming episode, Look, The Girl Who Was Plugged In, Nicole Tom plays a robot caught up in an unusual Without love triangle. Something that I've never done before, you know, playing a robot and um, uh, making choices like that. And I thought that the show um, had a lot of interesting, strange qualities to it, like different than anything that I'd ever seen before. It's not all just anger and, you know, um, uh, aliens, you know, coming down and um, eating people. It, it has, like, very realistic um, point of views in it, you know. It's very, it could happen. The creative team behind this new anthology series is hoping it will have the same impact as The Twilight Zone and The Outer Limits. Watch for Welcome to Paradox, Mondays at 10 p.m. Eastern, right here on the Sci-Fi Channel. Here's a horror fan who turned his childhood obsession into his adult profession. He's the editor of Fangoria Magazine, Tony Tempone. When I was in grammar school, luckily my folks never took me to Disney movies. They took me to drive-in theaters to see stuff like uh, Dracula has Risen from the Grave and Scream and Scream Again, Frogs, and movies like that. Tony Tempone was also addicted to famous monsters of filmland and began putting out his own magazines at a young age. Yeah, this was my first experience in uh, publishing. In high school, I put together these uh, fanzines as president of the science fiction club. And they were just mostly black and white Xeroxed off uh, the school copying machine and distributed amongst the, uh, the school people. Just three days after graduating from college, Tony went from working in his dad's deli to a staff writing job at Fangoria and its sister magazine, Starlog. Within a year, he had zoomed to the position of editor at Fangoria. Typical day at Fangoria usually involves uh, editing the new articles that come in from our writers, assigning new articles to uh, freelancers all across the world when new horror films go into production, uh, picking out that really good gruesome cover photo for the new issue of Fangoria, going to our art department and overseeing a new layout for a particularly uh, colorful story for the issue, calling a few horror celebrities to see which, one, which ones I could get to make a personal appearance at a Fangoria convention. While Tony is a savvy manager, he remains a fan at heart. Probably the, the most enjoyable part of my job is when I work with a lot of the horror celebrities, making, uh, having to make personal appearances at our Fangoria Weekend of Horrors conventions, meeting a lot of the heroes of the horror business. So far, the highlight of Tony's career was meeting his hero, Vincent Price, at a Fangoria convention. When I was in uh, college at NYU, I was always afraid to, uh, majoring in journalism, that I would get a job like putting together the classifieds for the local penny saver or, uh, or, or sweeping up the mail room or something like that. I never dreamed that I could go right to the top a year out of college. I'd be the editor of the world's number one horror movie magazine. It really was a dream come true. Coming up, our sci-fi best bets, plus behind the scenes of the TV series, Poltergeist The Legacy. Be sure to log on to the Dominion and check out these cyber events. Enter the Dominion by going to www.scifi.com. Stay back. Turn on your light. On Poltergeist The Legacy, an eclectic group of gifted investigators delves into the world of the supernatural. Every week, their adventures involve run-ins with some of sci-fi's most intriguing entities. They were tried, convicted, and burned at the stake. Their souls cursed to damnation, consigned to live in eternal darkness, never to see the sunlight again. Well, that certainly explains the effect that light has on them. And their grudge against the legacy. 
Although they share the same name, Poltergeist, the TV series, has very little in common with the popular 1980s films. It would be really difficult to do a series about, about a middle-aged family that moved from one haunted house to another, you know. What? It deals with belief systems and, and really not just with aliens or outer space, I mean, which seems to be the other sort of paranormal place that people seek, that this is... Um, that this deals really a lot with the philosophy and, and, and spiritualism. The door! No! Cast member Derek DeLint is getting his first taste of sci-fi as a member of the Legacy. Since joining the series, the Highland native has developed his own beliefs about real-life Ghostbusters. I am absolutely convinced that there are, maybe um, backed by the government, there are certain groups of people who are investing supernatural sightings. If there is something like the legacy, we should know about it. A series about people investigating paranormal activity sounds similar to The X-Files. However, the producers of Poltergeist The Legacy insist their show is different. Ours is much more character driven than the X Files, which I which I believe to be more story driven. And the other thing is, I mean, we accept the fact that X Files is, uh, you know, is a phenomena, and so I, I I wouldn't think that we're in the same league as them, in terms of viewership. But we'd like to think that we're in the same league as them in terms of providing uh, entertainment for the viewers. Two shows about people investigating supernatural and otherworldly activity doesn't seem to be a problem. And if you're already an X Files fan. Poltergeist the Legacy might be worth investigating on its own. Many of you probably know Gregory Benford as the Nebula award-winning author of Timescape, or maybe you've read his latest hard SF novel, Cosm. He's also a working astrophysicist and has served as an advisor to both NASA and the White House Council on Space Policy. So when Professor Benford proposed a serious commentary to us, we said sure. And then he said to meet him at the beach. Waves on the ocean are fun. Waves coming from alien civilizations are harder to detect. Lately, it's getting a bit noisy, just trying to eavesdrop on our interstellar neighbors. Astronomers, like me, are fighting to keep the radio airwaves clear because our big radio telescopes listen for signals from possible alien civilizations many light years away, as in Carl Sagan's film, Contact. We listen to a large catalog of reasonably nearby stars in frequencies around a billion cycles per second. This is a region where molecules important to life, notably water and hydrogen, emit strong frequencies. Our logic is that water-based life forms would have some affinity for this fact and broadcast in that region. But there's an even better reason which causes all the trouble. Those frequencies are also near the minimum noise levels emitted by our own background, the Earth and atmosphere. So cell phones like to use them, bouncing signals off the swarms of communication satellites that orbit overhead. Astronomy is on a collision course with our own convenience. The new Iridium class of communication satellites often slops over into the hallowed frequencies used by astronomers. Who will win? Right now, we're trying to work out a timeshare with astronomers eavesdropping on other stars in the low telephone traffic hours after midnight. But as worldwide traffic grows and satellites crowd the spectrum to bring you more SF entertainment, like this show, there's a battle shaping up. Will science lose out to science fiction? Best part of this job, well, to me anyway, is all the cool sci-fi paraphernalia that comes into the office each week. Some of it being pretty paranormal paraphernalia. That's why we separate the good from the bad and only tell you about the good stuff, like this week's best bets. This week, for example, we found some excellent new video games. Choose your warrior. The first two are from Midway for both the PlayStation and Nintendo 64. BioFreaks takes place in the future, where warring corporations use fighting machines to settle their differences. The game features eight of these highly detailed freaks, each with dozens of moves and plenty of firepower. But be warned, 
Bio Freaks is extremely violent and not for the faint of heart. The battle is finished. Your quest for vengeance is over, Scorpion. Also from Midway comes Mortal Kombat 4. The Mortal Kombat series has always been the premier hand-to-hand -hand fighting game, and MK4 certainly carries on the tradition. As always, there are lots of interesting characters, each with their own unique personalities. Expect MK4 or Biofreaks to each cost you 50 bucks. If you prefer something a bit less violent, check out Unreal from GT Interactive. Though the game does have its share of hostile aliens to battle, it also features intriguing puzzles, beautifully realistic graphics, and even lets you design new environments. This last feature, called the Unreal Level Editor, enables users to create their own 3D worlds and populate them with creatures of their choosing. These new Unreal worlds can then be shared or even traded via the internet. Unreal requires a Pentium 166 or faster PC and costs about $50. Those are this week's Sci-Fi Best Bets. That's all the sci-fi entertainment we can get into this week's show. But don't forget to tune in next week for an all-new sci-fi entertainment. See you then.